Hello, this is the voice of Marcy Dwyer, the Executive Director for the Detroit District Dental Society. We're very pleased that David Fisher from U of D Mercy will be making a presentation for us on the COVID vaccine. David Fisher is an Assistant Professor and the Interim Director of the Division of Integrated Biomedical Sciences at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry. Dr. Fisher has a bachelor's degree in cellular and molecular biology from the University of Michigan, a PhD from Wayne State University School of Medicine, where he studied influenza vaccines and the potential for the avian influenza pandemic, and conducted postdoctoral research at Ohio State's Agricultural Research and Development Center. At Ohio State, he studied rotavirus vaccinations. Dr. Fisher joined Detroit Mercy Dental in 2017. He teaches immunology to dental students, dental hygiene students, and residents. His current research focuses on the role of the herpes virus in the progression of periodontal disease. We are again very pleased to have David Fisher join us today. If you have questions during the program, please use the chat to post your questions and we will try to address as many as possible. Throughout the presentation, any questions submitted previously have been given to Dr. Fisher. The session will be recorded. And again, uh, the slides and handout will be set out after the program. The CE will be um, given out based on those who complete the program survey that will be sent out to you with the slides and handouts. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Fisher, and please go ahead and start. All right, good morning, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. All right, thank you, Marcy. I really appreciate the invitation from you and the Detroit District Dental Society to uh, come speak with you today. Yeah, so I've been heavily involved in the uh, dental school's uh, COVID response, and then also, you know, my background is in uh, vaccine development and, uh, you know, vaccine yes. modification to get, you know, optimal performance. So I know there's been a lot of questions about, you know, these new vaccines. How were they able to be rolled out so quickly? Uh, what might be some of the consequences of getting the vaccine or not getting the vaccine? So I've compiled, uh, so you can certainly feel free to contact me after the fact if you come up with any questions. The best way to get in touch with me is via email, which is listed here. And um, my colleague, Josh Thompson, also helped put this uh, material together. He's another assistant professor over at the dental school who uh, teaches all the virology content there. So please feel free to contact uh, either one of us. I have some resources here. There's some links to the handouts from the uh, Pfizer and Moderna clinical trials. I'm going to focus primarily on those two vaccines today because those are the ones that are out with the emergency use authorizations. It should be noted that there are several other vaccines in the pipeline, but they are all still several months out from getting emergency use approval. So I am not really going to spend time on those today. Now, if you're looking for some good resources to keep up to date with uh, the pandemic, learn a little bit more about the virology and the immunology, there's a link to a couple. Uh, sorry, I'm going to try to mute everyone here. I've got to get some feedback. Um, I've got some links to a couple podcasts here this week in virology and immune. They you know, they get into the science, but they're also very accessible to those who do not have you know, a science background or a virology or immunology background, and they're really up to date. They take a critical look at all the information that is out there. So, you know, it features researchers, it features physicians who are on the front lines, and it, they're really, really great resources. So the objectives today, I want you to be able to compare and contrast the types and efficacies of the available SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. We'll talk about the risks and potential benefits of receiving the vaccines. And then we'll talk about some of the vaccine information and disinformation that is out there. The first half will be some general background on how vaccines work, uh, the two vaccines that have been approved for emergency use authorization. Then the second half will focus on some very common questions that, that we have been getting about the vaccine and the vaccine rollout. So one distinction we need to make is the difference between infection and viral infectious diseases. So an infection occurs when there's colonization by a pathogen on or within the body. You know, bacteria and fungi can live on surfaces or they can live inside of cells. Viruses exclusively live inside the cell. 
So for a viral infection to happen, they have to get inside a cell and start replicating. So an example here, of course, would be with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, they infect the epithelial cells of the lung. Now, sometimes we know when we're infected with the virus, other times we don't. You know, there are people who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 who do not experience any diseases. They're said to be asymptomatic. You know, um, about 95% of the adult population has Epstein-Barr virus in their system. Sometimes that leads to mononucleosis. Most people never even knew they have it, but that virus is with us all the time and we don't really notice anything from it. Now, a viral infection can lead to viral infectious disease. So that's when the virus gets into the body and it prevents it from functioning normally, usually by destroying some type of tissue or some type of cells. So when the SARS-CoV-2 virus gets into the lung epithelial cells, <clears throat> damages those cells, triggers a powerful immune response and an inflammatory response, and that leads to signs and symptoms of the COVID-19 disease. So you can have SARS-CoV-2 without developing disease, but you're not going to have the disease COVID-19 unless you've been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. <clears throat> and viral infections really run, a run the gamut. They can be asymptomatic. They can cause mild symptoms. They can cause severe symptoms. They can cause chronic illness like HIV and AIDS, or in some cases, they can even lead to death. <clears throat> so the virus that we'll be talking about today is SARS-CoV-2. So the SARS part stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. The COV, coronavirus, and the two, it's related to, but it is distinct from the virus that caused the 2003 SARS outbreak. So it tells you right in the name, the disease it causes, <clears throat> what it's caused by, and that it's a member of a family that's caused disease in the human population before. <clears throat> and again, this virus, of course, first emerged in November of 2019 uh, in China. And so the disease that is caused by Co SARS-CoV-2 is COVID-19. So the CO is Corona, VI virus, D disease, and 19 first emerged in 2019. So I've been involved in, you know, recording who's been uh, sick at the dental school. You know, I talk to people about their symptoms. I do the contact tracing. And it is really incredible how different this virus presents in, in various people. You know, some people go get a test because they are exposed. They feel perfectly fine. They never experience any symptoms, but they come back positive for the virus. Other people think, oh, I'm feeling run down. You know, they typically they might think of that because, you know, they're a busy dental student or maybe their faculty member who's been working long hours in the clinic, you know, or the headache, they think it might be tension headache. But then a couple of days later, sometimes, you know, they start experiencing uh, chills, fever, you know, loss of taste and smell. Some people doesn't progress beyond that. Others end up with some pretty serious respiratory issues. You know, some people have severe gastrointestinal disturbances. Others do not. Um, so it's, the disease is different in each person, you know, everyone perceives these things differently. Um, the virus can impact people differently based on a person's immune response and the infectious dose. But in general, the disease is these collections of symptoms, you know, that we have come to know uh, that are associated with COVID-19. And just anecdotally, what I see the most is, you know, people typically uh, start off with like maybe a headache or allergy-like symptoms. But then about three days after that, that's when the loss of taste or smell kicks in and then the fever and chills. And it should be noted that, you know, a lot of people, most of the people that I have interacted with who, who have had the disease are in their um, early to mid 20s. So um, not as many of the faculty have, have dealt with it, but, you know, we've had a few people get pretty sick. All right, so let's go through the process of an infection. So a virus, here's an example of SARS-CoV-2 in the cartoon on the right here. To establish an infection, it first must get into the cell. You know, a bacteria, you can grow it in a dish, you can grow on surfaces. A virus, say if you sneeze it out and it gets onto a countertop, it cannot replicate on its own. The only way the virus can replicate and make new viruses is to get into a cell and use our cell's machinery to you know, produce new viruses. Now, when it gets into the cells, it can cause a lot of damage and then it can cause disease. So the virus has these spike proteins on the surface. So the spike protein attaches to a molecule on our cells called ACE2, angiotensin-converting enzyme. 
So after it does that, the spike protein undergoes a bit of a conformational change, and it allows the virus to get into the cell. So here, after the virus gets into the cell, it releases its genetic material. So people, we have a DNA genome. Um, this virus has an RNA genome. The viruses can have DNA or RNA genomes. This particular virus has an mRNA genome. Now, no virus can produce protein on its own. Viruses are very tiny. They don't have the room for organelles or all sorts of machinery. They're basically just a code encased in some protein that can go in and trigger uh, a cell to make new viruses. So it gets in, releases its RNA. It uses our ribosomes to make protein. So the virus replicates its RNA. It has the machinery to make new RNA. It uses our cells to make new proteins. Then eventually we make new baby viruses and they butt out from the cells. They can go on and infect, infect neighboring cells or they can be coughed or sneezed or released as, as in aerosols to go on and infect the next person. So the virus constantly needs access to new fresh cells and new hosts for it to be able to grow. Now, eventually uh, we'll have an immune response that will uh, inhibit the virus from growing in our body. So it's very important for it to be able to go on and infect someone new. Now, when we have an antibody or an immune response, there are two arms of the immune system that react. So you have your innate immune system, which is a very nonspecific part of the immune system. It recognizes that a virus is present and then kicks the immune system into full gear. And then there's an adaptive immune response. It takes about a week to 14 days to get into full gear. So what the adaptive immune system lacks in speed, it more than makes up for in precision. So the adaptive immune response activates our B cells and our T cells. Our B cells are very important for making antibodies. So after about you know, a week, 10 days in of the infection, we start making these antibodies. So the most important antibodies are going to be ones that bind to the spike protein. Now, if you have an antibody that's grabbed onto the spike protein there, that means that that virus is no longer able to be able to attach to and enter a cell. So an antibody can prevent an infection from even happening. Now, these antibodies can then target the virus for destruction. Um, it can help you know, them just be glommed up and swept away. But the biggest thing is that they antibodies to the spike protein will stop the virus from attaching and getting into cells. Again, if a virus cannot get into a cell, it cannot establish an infection, it can't replicate, and it cannot cause damage. Now, we also make T cells. T cells help coordinate the immune response, and they also work to kill infected cells. Now, T cells are very important in the immune response, but they only will work after the virus has infected the cells. So, it's important that we make antibodies when we make a vaccine, but the T cell response is also important too, you know, because sometimes these viruses can get around the antibodies. So they can get in the cells, they can maybe establish an infection then, but the T cells are there and they can help clear that out very quickly. And in fact, they might be able to clear out the infection before you even show any signs or symptoms of the disease, or it could significantly reduce the disease severity. So it's important that we generate both B cell and T cell responses in response to an active infection or when we're making a vaccine. And so how can we get or produce antibodies that neutralize SARS-CoV-2? Well, the obvious way is a naturally incurring infection. So a person gets the disease, it gets the virus, they have an immune response and they should have some immune protection. That immune protection may last months, years, or it may last a lifetime. The goal is for it to last a lifetime. The problem here is you have to have the infection first. And, you know, as we know, the coronavirus here is devastating. Yes, you know, some people don't react too badly to it. Others have a very unfortunate illness. You know, some will recover in a few weeks, but it's a very lousy few weeks. Um, other people have long-term effects. We're starting to learn about some of these longer effects. You might hear, have heard of the long haulers who are experiencing symptoms several months out. Uh, people can end up with myocarditis, inflammation of the heart. There's reports of people having brain fog and uh, decreased cognitive function for a period of time. Uh, we're learning about the lung damage that can occur. And then unfortunately, a lot of people, you know, almost 400,000 people in this country have died from the virus. 
So they do not get to be re-exposed to it. They've lost their lives before, you know, the, they can have immunity built up to the disease. You can also transfer antibodies to a person. This isn't always practical. Uh, the natural route, of course, would be a mother to fetus. You know, um, IgG antibodies can be transferred through the placenta. Antibodies can be transferred from a mother to a nursing infant. Or also a person could, you know, donate convalescent plasma. So you donate plasma, the, uh, you, the cellular fraction will be returned to your body, but they would take the liquid portion of the blood, which contains antibodies, and they could try giving it to a person to alleviate disease symptoms. So the problem there it's you have to give these antibodies very early on in infection. And part of the problem with SARS-CoV-2 is that you show symptoms, you develop COVID disease um, after the infection has already started. So you'd have to basically give these antibodies right when symptoms are starting or before they even start for it to really be effective. There are also artificial ways of transferring antibodies to people. There are antibodies that can be made in the lab. So you may have heard of the Regeneron cocktail that um, some high profile public officials have received. And then Eli Lilly also has a version too. Again, that must be done very early in infection. A lot of times if someone's showing symptoms or severe symptoms, it's probably too late. It's important to note that in COVID-19, the initial symptoms are caused by damage from the virus. The later and more severe symptoms, especially the inflammation, the conditions that would put a person on a ventilator, that damage is done due to the immune response. So if you're already in the phase where the damage from the immune response is occurring, it's probably too late for these antibodies. Now these antibodies are incredibly expensive. The Regeneron's $1,500 a dose. Um, the bam Lanivimab from Eli Lilly, that's $1,250 a dose. And they also have to be given by IV injection. So they may be effective, but they're not very practical. So the best way to get antibodies that would neutralize SARS-CoV-2 would be by giving a vaccine. There are multiple types of vaccines out there. Um, I don't know, and let me just talk about the general versions first, then I'll get into what is actually available or being produced for SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. So there's some vaccines where you give a person a weakened version of the virus, like the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. You give very weakened versions of the virus, that trigger an immune response, but don't cause disease. So you'd have antibodies and T cells ready to react when a person would be naturally infected. There are no live attenuated vaccines in the pipeline for SARS-CoV-2. Now you can also make proteins that are isolated from you know, growing up large amounts of virus or proteins that are generated in the lab that would cause a person to make a neutralizing antibodies. The injected flu vaccine is an example of this. They're known as subunit vaccines and inactivated virus vaccines. There are some subunit virus uh, vaccines for SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 in the pipeline, but they're still several months out from approval. The third way is to give a vaccination with material that it will cause our cells to produce a protein that will induce neutralizing antibodies in T cells. And so these are the mRNA vaccines. So the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are both versions of this. And there are also viral vector vaccines. The uh, AstraZeneca vaccine that is available in the UK uh, is a version of the viral vector vaccine. Uh, that's probably still several months out from approval in the US, but it is out there. And I'll get into what mRNA vaccines are in the coming slides. So again, vaccination, it's the best route to prevent infection. You know, you give something that causes, you know, that doesn't cause infection, that stimulates an immune response that can then protect you from the virus. The antibodies would neutralize the virus, hopefully before it could even get into the cells. And if somehow the virus were to overwhelm the antibody response, you'd then have some T cell backup to help you out. And so vaccination, it primes the immune system. It arms you to prevent viral infections. So the goal is to make neutralizing antibodies. And also you wanna generate immune memory. You would like this protection to last. Sometimes this protection can last months. Sometimes it can last years. Sometimes it can last a lifetime. And you also want to induce a T cell response. So you have the short-term protection in the months after infection and then protection years down the road. And so why do we vaccinate? You know, the, a lot of times we talk about completely preventing infection from happening. That isn't always possible. 
the primary goal is to prevent severe disease. So you may hear with the flu shot that it's 30 to 60% effective in completely preventing disease. Yeah, okay, or infection. Yeah, that's great. Uh, but you might say, ooh, only 30 to 60%, why bother? Well, it can help prevent severe disease. So if you get the flu shot, a person you may still get the flu, but it'll reduce your the severity of the disease. It should reduce the risk of hospitalization. It will reduce the duration of hospitalization, and it can reduce the risk of death. So even though it might not prevent infection in 100% of people, it can significantly reduce the burden of disease. So what we may find out with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccination is that, you know, it, it certainly one of these vaccines may take it from being a severe disease that causes hospitalization and overwhelms the healthcare system to something that, you know, might resemble more like a common cold. The ultimate goal is to prevent infection entirely, keep the virus from getting into cells. That doesn't always happen. So we would like to be able to prevent disease entirely. So you give the vaccine, okay, maybe the virus can still get in the cells, but you don't show any signs or symptoms of disease. We can also vaccinate to protect those at the most severe risk of disease. So for this pandemic, that would be the elderly and those with pre-existing conditions and those who are at high risk of exposure, you know, the healthcare workers and first responders. And we also want to be able to decrease the sources of transmission. So we want to be sure that we would like to see that if a person is vaccinated, that they can no longer spread the disease. That doesn't always happen. We'll, we'll uh, in the upcoming slides, we'll kind of see where we're at with this status, but it does seem that these vaccines are incredibly effective in preventing disease entirely. We're still learning about the ability to completely cut off people as a source of transmission. There's some data out there, it's looking promising, but we'll still have to see. So what is an mRNA vaccine? So first it contains an mRNA sequence from the virus. So what we did, we sequenced the SARS-CoV-2 virus after it was first isolated. This happened in a matter of weeks. We've done great things with our sequencing technologies. And so after we sequenced it, they're able to isolate the sequence that codes for the spike protein, the one that neutralizes, that induces neutralizing antibodies. So Pfizer and Moderna, they spent some time optimizing the sequence to make sure it was stable and that it and optimize it so it would induce efficient protein production. It was then uh, encased in lipid nanoparticles. That lipid nanoparticle allows the, the uh, RNA to get inside the cell. RNA is not going to get inside the cell on its own. If you just injected RNA, it would be immediately destroyed by enzymes in the body. So this lipid nanoparticle ensures that the RNA can get into cells where it can start producing protein. So after the vaccine is injected, the RNA gets into the cells using the lipid nanoparticles. Then the RNA is translated into protein. The cells that have been that have taken up this RNA, they produce spike protein. It is presented on the surface of the cell. Uh, antigen presenting cells can recognize that or take it up, and then it can induce an immune response. Uh, I think that this technology is going to win the Nobel Prize in sometime in the near future. You know, it's a lot of really clever things have been done with isolating, being able to isolate the sequences to maximize the production of the of the RNA in the cells to make uh, protein and to uh, stimulate immune responses. So this is really exciting technology. And so again, lipid nanoparticle gets into the cell. The ribosomes make protein. You make express spike protein. So when the cell dies or you know is stressed, these antigen presenting cells are going to come take up that all the debris from the cell, including that spike protein, those antigen presenting cells will digest that protein and present it to the immune system. It'll start producing uh, B and T cells. So you make B cells, they produce antibodies that will neutralize the virus and the helper T cells and killer T cells that will then protect the person from disease or infection. So it's a very clever way of doing things. So you might ask, why do we have to go with the mRNA vaccine? You know, there aren't any of these approved. Why were these the first available? Why are these being pushed so hard? Well, a traditional protein vaccine 
may, it requires a lot of optimization. So either you'd have to grow a tremendous amount of the infectious material, and when we have something as deadly as SARS-CoV-2, we don't necessarily want to do that, or you'd have to purify large amounts of the spike protein. That's very difficult to do. First, you have to make sure that the spike protein will grow properly in a cell. You need it to fold properly. If it doesn't fold right, or if it's modified in some way, you're not going to make antibodies that protect against the real virus. It has to go through a purification process. You have to see if it'll be modified by cells. You have to see if it'll be stable. And also these protein vaccines don't generally stimulate the strongest immune responses. So you'd have to figure out if you need to add an adjuvant to increase the um, immune response to the protein. That being said, there are several of these in the pipeline, but due to the challenges in the production process, they are several months behind the mRNA vaccines. And so even though mRNA vaccines have not received full FDA approval before, they aren't a brand new technology. They've been extensively studied for the past 10 years. In fact, Moderna, modern RNA, that's what the company drives its name from. That's what this company does, is make mRNA delivery platforms. Um, and they had already completed phase one trials, as have other companies, for vaccines using this technology. Now, that platform is very flexible. You know, I talked about the capping and the optimization and the lipid nanoparticle delivery. That was already there. Basically, all they needed to do was isolate that genetic sequence, make those optimizations, and it was ready to go. They were able to do this in a matter of weeks, which is just incredible. So this is a very flexible platform that can be used to respond rapidly to, to new targets. So all they needed was to get that mRNA sequence, make the plasmids that generate the mRNA. They're then able to induce a chemical reaction, so basically in the test tube, to make the RNA from DNA. They then packaged it with lipid nanoparticles, and then they give that RNA to the body. Then the body, the cells, do all the heavy lifting when it comes to making protein. They make the protein, they trigger the immune response, and also mRNA is very good at inducing immune responses. So that's why these vaccines were so quick to come out. And, and it's really impressive what we were able to do here. So I wanna go through the features of these vaccines and any like the major differences between the two, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. So they are both based off very similar mRNA platforms. There are some small differences in the sequence optimization, and both companies have their own proprietary lipid uh, nanoparticle delivery systems. The Pfizer vaccine has emergency use approval for people 16 and up. The Moderna vaccine is for 18 and up. The Pfizer vaccine is given 21 days apart. The Moderna vaccine is given 28 days apart. I've got some questions why the ages. Well, that's what they applied for in the clinical trials. I know that's been studied in children as young as 12, and there are additional trials going on in children. Clinical trials, you know, they're always reluctant to test in children. You want to give it, you know, the people who you're most comfortable giving it to are adults who can easily consent to getting the vaccine. Uh, also, adults tend to get far more severe COVID than children. So it was more beneficial to give to the adults too, but basically any clinical trial you see, it's going to be given to adults first before children. Uh, there are some more tests being done in children at this time. Get some questions, why 21 days, why 28 days? Well, you want to have a bit of a gap between the first and second dose uh, because you want the immune reaction to occur, to wane. And so when you give the second dose that you're triggering a memory response. It's really important that you activate memory cells, produce new memory cells, and that you stimulate a strong memory response, which will build an even better memory response for the future. Um, I think Pfizer and Moderna probably had preliminary data from some of their other clinical trials or maybe animal experiments that showed that maybe 21 days work best for Pfizer, 28 days work best for Moderna. It's not really a big deal there, but just be aware of which vaccine you get You'll get a card with which vaccine you got and when you should come back for follow-up. So, you know, follow this guideline as close as possible. Uh, both of the vaccines are, are outstanding in efficacy. You know, I think the emergency use authorization guidelines were looking into about 50 to 60% efficacy for approval. Well, this blew that away. The Mo Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are both about 95% effective after two doses. 
that is really outstanding news. I would have been thrilled if something was out there with 60% efficacy. Something with 95% efficacy is just amazing. It should be noted that the Moderna vaccine may be more effective after the first dose. Pfizer 52%, Moderna 80%, but both are going to jump up to 95% after that second dose. Uh, the Moderna vaccine may have some more side effects, particularly after the second dose, but in general, they tend to be mild. Uh, one thing to note that the Pfizer vaccine may be more widely available in Michigan, just based on the ordering at this time in contracts. I would have been fine getting either one of the vaccines. I was fortunate enough to be able to get the Moderna vaccine uh, through the School of Dentistry's arrangement with the health department. I know um, other friends and other healthcare um, who, who are in the healthcare field, a lot of them have got the Pfizer vaccine. Again, I would have been fine getting either one of them. I don't really see any differences between the two other than some of the, those little minor details. And so they both have mRNA sequences and co uh, covered in lipid nanoparticles. The Pfizer dose is 30 micrograms. The Moderna is 100 micrograms. Um, the Pfizer one, again, three weeks apart, uh, 0.3 mils. The Moderna, 0.5 ml, four weeks apart. When I got the shot, I barely even felt it. You know, it, it was much less than what I feel with the typical flu vaccine. Both of these underwent rigorous clinical trials. So even though they were approved quickly, they underwent very rigorous testing. This isn't some half-hearted measure. Phase three clinical trials are a big deal. They were both double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled. So they were the gold standard trials. The Pfizer vaccine had 44,000 participants. The Moderna had 30,000 participants and both received the emergency use authorizations last month. And these charts show what happened after people got their first doses. Uh, unfortunately, they flipped the colors, but in the Pfizer vaccine here, that blue line, that is the people who are vaccinated. The red line are the people who got placebo. The x-axis is the timeout from receiving first dose. The y-axis is the incidence of COVID-19. So you can see that they kind of track together until about 10 days out. Then it completely levels off for the vaccinated group. So about 10 days in, that's when a person starts to make antibodies to the vaccine. So you can see as soon as antibodies started being produced, people were protected. Same thing with the Moderna vaccine, although the colors are flipped, the red's vaccinated here, the blue is the placebo group. So that's really, that really just shows you how effective these are. And you can see that the protection is lasting out several months as well. So just really uh, spectacular data. And so all in all, the Pfizer vaccine has about 95% efficacy after uh, two doses. So during the clinical trial, there were one of the, at the point when 170 cases happened between the two groups, they unblinded it and looked at the data. At that point, they found 162 cases in placebo, eight in the vaccine group. There were 10 severe cases of COVID-19, nine were in the placebo group, one was in the vaccine group. For Moderna, 94.1%, 185 cases in placebo, 11 in the vaccine group. And in the clinical trial, the vaccine efficacy against severe disease was 100%. Uh, 30 severe cases in the placebo, zero in the vaccine. And for both, the efficacy seems to be consistent across age, race, ethnicity, and gender. So really outstanding news. Now you might be asking about some of the adverse events. And so chances are you're going to experience some sort of side effect after getting the vaccine. Most are minor. So both in both vaccines, the most commonly reported thing was pain at the injection site, 84% uh, for Pfizer, 92% for Moderna. Uh, I had some slight pain at the injection site, but it was less than what I typically feel from the annual flu vaccine. So like the next day, I could kind of feel it when I moved my arm up, but really it was very minor, felt just like a little pinch, uh, didn't impact my day at all. So fatigue, 60 to 70% of people, headaches can occur in about half, uh, myalgia, and talking to the students, most of them felt fine. Just about everyone I've talked to has had some pain at the injection site. A few reported uh, myalgia and headaches, some with you know mild fever around like 99 degrees. Uh, I talked to a few people who, you know, very rare, had some 
reactions the next day with, uh, you know, nausea, digestive issues, and pretty bad headache. But uh, both of those people, you know, two of the people I'd heard from, they popped back in a matter of hours. So, you know, do be prepared that you might not feel well the next day. Uh, and I will get into why that happens. Now, in, and again, most of these are minor, it, and really uh, most people are able to deal with it. Uh, sometimes, you know, maybe some Tylenol helped out as well. It should be noted that the Pfizer vaccine has had some cases of anaphylaxis. So about 21 out of nearly 2 million doses, so about 11 out of a million people experience that. Most of these occurred in 15 minutes. In 17 of the 21, uh, the people had a history of allergies or allergic reactions. So they will ask you questions about your allergy history and do note if you have had any sort of serious or troubling allergic reaction in the past. Uh, seven of the people had a history of anaphylaxis. So anyone who gets the vaccine is going to be monitored for at least 15 minutes. You'll be monitored for 30 minutes if you have a history of allergic reactions. This is why, so please don't give the people a hard time if they ask you to stick, they, when they tell you to stick around for a little bit. Again, incredibly unlikely, but you know, if you do have a reaction, there will be people on site with EpiPens to, to help out. Uh, the Moderna vaccine, I haven't seen reports of anaphylaxis, but there have been some reports of Bell's palsy. In the clinical trial, there were three in the, in the vaccine group, one in the placebo. This wasn't statistically significant, and it looked, and it's, it, Bell's palsy occurs at, at about this rate in the general population. Should also be noted that the virus itself can induce Bell's palsy too, uh, so I wouldn't be too concerned about that. Uh, there have been two serious events in people with a history of injected dermatological fillers, and the Moderna vaccine may have some higher incidence of these uh, side effects after the second dose. But again, you know, it, it, it's all minor, mostly minor, and again, it's far better than dealing with multiple weeks of being sick from SARS-CoV-2. So now I wanna hit on some of the frequently asked questions and I'm happy to take questions in the chat and uh, follow up on things at the end too, if you want me to expand on anything. So I'll go through about when can you get vaccinated, the emergency use process, the vaccine development timeline, can the, vi can the vaccine cause COVID, why do you f might you feel unwell after being vaccinated? Uh, there's stuff out on the internet. Will the components of the vaccine alter my DNA? How long is the protection? How many doses should you get? Should you get vaccinated after already being sick? Um, pregnancy, vaccine, and fertility have been a frequent area of questions as well. I'll touch on those. Um, what's in the vaccine? Then some questions about herd immunity and the variants that have emerged. <clears throat> So when can you get vaccinated? Uh, anyone in here, I'm assuming, is a dental health care professional. So you are considered a frontline worker. You're immediately available in phase 1A. So if you contact your health department, they should be able to get you in uh, very quickly. <clears throat> so what about maybe you know, your friends or family who might work in another field? Maybe you know someone with a chronic condition that's at high risk. Uh, phase 1B has opened up as well. Uh, before I get to phase 1B and phase 1A, those in long-term care facilities are eligible as well because they are extremely vulnerable. Phase 1B is opened up this week for people 65 and up, frontline workers like police officers, EMTs, a certain state and federal workers, jail and prison staffs, and then pre-K to tw uh, grade 12 teachers and child care providers are all eligible now. Yeah, these phases are kind of fluid. overlap a bit. Phase one is open mid to late February, so that would be people with chronic conditions like hypertension, COPD, uh, obesity, diabetes, uh, and the like. And then for the general population, those with no risk factors or pre-existing conditions, uh, Health and Human Services is hoping to get into that in April to May. We're hoping it'll come quicker, but you know we'll see how the vaccine rollout goes. It's been kind of clunky uh, from the federal level, but I think um, you know, medical facilities and the state are doing a good job picking up the slack. So again, go out, get it if you have the opportunity. You know, don't feel guilty about cutting in line or feeling like you're cutting in line, um, you know, because there are vaccines sitting on the shelf that are expiring. So 
I think the key thing is if you're offered it, get it, you know, we need to start getting doses into arms and start protecting the whole population. Stop dilly dallying and get people covered. That's just my editorial though. All right, so there's questions. Are these two vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, FDA approved? So at this time, they have not received full FDA approval, but they are approved under an emergency use authorization. So the FDA in times of emergency, like a catastrophic global pandemic, have the ability to make a product available to the public based on best available evidence. And it doesn't have to hit all the benchmarks that would typically need for full FDA approval or clearance. So we're working on available evidence versus substantial evidence. So all sorts of things right now are being used under emergency use authorization, like KN95 masks, basically any of the diagnostic tests, they're under emergency use authorization. There's evidence they work, but it's just not as rigorous as what you would typically have. Both of these vaccines, again, they have gone through phase three clinical trials and have emergency use authorization. So for the example, the Pfizer vaccine was evaluated for the EUA after 170 of the 44,000 recipients of the placebo or vaccine came down with COVID-19. At that point, they looked at the efficacy, which was great. They looked at the incidence of adverse events, which were acceptable. And these vaccines were approved because these benefits significantly outweighed the risk. So you might be asking, what is some of the evidence that a typical vaccine would need for approval that these don't? And again, I want to reiterate that the clinical trials and safety testing were incredibly rigorous. They're high standard. They aren't half-hearted measures. These are very serious. And it was not easy to get the emergency use approval. Now, there were some animal tests done to test for safety and toxicity, but there weren't as many tests done for immunity because we really don't have a good animal model for which to study this virus. Also, the antibody response was looked at a shorter time period. So two months following vaccination rather than six months or several years. You know, we've right now we're seeing, we wanna see, can we at least get short-term protection? These vaccines can do that. Uh, the six month data, the eight month data is starting to come out and it looks promising as well. And again, we'll keep going through the standard FDA approval process. You know, they're looking for efficacy. They're looking for adverse events. And this will all go to hopefully eventually full clearance by the, by the FDA. And also there's two month rather than six month follow-ups for adverse medical events. Um, I would think that just about any adverse event is going to occur right after the injection. I don't see any biological way that there would be long-term impacts. And even then, if there were impacts, I think that, you know, if you got infected with the virus, the impact would probably be the same or worse. So, you know, they're going to keep continue keeping an eye on this and we'll report that as these numbers continue to come out. And so you ask about the time frame. You know, most vaccines take at least 10 years. How come this was done in one year? Well, a lot of times, it, you know, there's people researching all sorts of different things. You know, someone could be looking for a universal flu vaccine. Someone might be looking for something, you know, to help protect against HIV. There's all sorts of, or, you know, Zika, any emerging disease. So there's lots of people looking at lots of different things. It takes some time to optimize these, a profile it, look for the target, do studies in animals, so on and so forth. Here again, we were able to identify a target almost immediately and we were able to refine it quickly and we were able to get clinical trials going very quickly and scale things up. So again, the mRNA platform allows the quicker turnaround time. It's a much faster manufacturing process than a lot of those traditional vaccines. You know, in, in general, when we're putting out new vaccines, we tend to be very conservative. A lot of it's due to the disinformation out there. And so people tend to go with tried and true protein vaccines. They, and generally, they take a little bit longer to produce. Here, time was of the essence because we have so many people getting sick and dying. Uh, the mRNA platform was best here. And again, there are protein-based vaccines in the pipeline. There are a lot of other factors here. There's urgency. You know, most vaccines that are under development are made for pathogens that are non-deadly. Um, they're rare. They might be slow to cause disease. And they aren't typically causing global pandemics. So, you know, we've had something that has disrupted our lives for almost a year, killed loved ones, sickened people. So there's been unprecedented pressure to get this vaccine out. 
Also money, money equals progress in science. Now 4.1 billion from the CARES Act alone went to vaccine development, plus other federal funding, state funding, private funding, a tremendous, and uh, all the money that's been spent internationally, tremendous amount of money has been put in this direction. And also it's unprecedented to have redirection of basically all the resources in academia and industry going towards preventing one disease. You know, we're focusing on all sorts of different things, you know, cancer, infectious disease, inflammatory diseases, chronic conditions. It's rare to have so much focus being put on one particular thing. And also the clinical trials happened incredibly rapidly. You know, most of the time it takes several years to get tens of thousands of people to sign up. You know, you say, hey, here's a vaccine for, I don't know, let's, let's say Zika. You know, it's kind of, it's not in the news anymore. Uh, most people don't get really sick from it. So you're going to have trouble persuading people to sign up for it. Well, here, since, you know, people were eager to help out in the pandemic response, people were eager to maybe have a 50% chance of getting protected earlier on. So we got tens of thousands of people to sign up in weeks in a process that would usually take several years. So the eagerness to be in the clinical trials was huge. Also, SARS-CoV-2 is incredibly infectious and there are a lot of cases of it circulating. So it made it really easy to get the numbers to get the statistical really sound data. A lot of times it would take years to get a number of exposures and cases to get good results. Here, since it is still spreading like wildfire through society, we were able to get enough people exposed and sick in the placebo group and vaccinated group that we were able to judge the efficacy at a very quick rate. So all these factors came together to get these vaccines out in a very quick period of time. Let's shift gears. There's questions about could these vaccines cause an infection leading to COVID-19? Absolutely not. So remember the mRNA, only contains the, gener the genetic material that makes the spike protein. Again, they pick the spike protein because that allows the virus to get in the cells and antibodies towards the spike protein stop infection. If you were to develop antibodies towards other things, it wouldn't be very effective in stopping infection. So that's why we target the spike protein. For an infection to occur, you would need all 29 proteins from SARS-CoV-2 plus the full genetic sequence. So we have about 1 30th of what you would need to actually establish an infection. So it builds an immune response, but there's no way these vaccines could cause an infection. It's impossible. So you might say, okay, doesn't cause infection. Why are people feeling fatigued, having headaches, having all these issues after being vaccinated? Well, it's not because of an infection, it's because an immune reaction is occurring. And so when an immune reaction occurs, it makes the body hostile to pathogens and it redirects resources to the immune system. The immune response takes a lot of energy. So you're growing all sorts of cells. You're putting energy into clearing out an infection, building an immune response, making antibodies, making T cells, and making immune memory. So it uses a lot of energy, which of course will make you feel tired. And also the immune response is very damaging. Now, typically when you're sick, you're feeling the combined effects of a pathogen and of the immune system activation. So think of that feeling you get when you can tell you're coming down with something, but you're not sure what it's going to be. Well, a lot of that feeling right there is the nonspecific effects of the immune system kicking in. Now, when you're sick, when you have an infection, the virus, the bacteria, that's going to start causing damage as well. So when you're sick, you feel the combined effects of the pathogens damage and the damage and infl inflammation being caused by the immune reaction. When you're vaccinated, you're not feeling the effects of the pathogen damage, you are feeling the effects of immune activation. Again, the immune response is very powerful. You only want it turned on and in a limited capacity. But when it's on, inflammation will happen. So that's why you're going to have pain at the injection site. When you trigger an immune response, you make molecules that communicate with the in immune system. They also change the behavior of cells in your body, redirect resources. So those cytokines and interferons are going to cause fever, aches and pain, and malaise. And again, the immune re response takes a lot of energy, so that's why you might feel fatigue and headache. So again, you are feeling the effects of an immune reaction. You're not feeling the effects of an infection. 
Uh, and so will the vaccine cause you to test positive for COVID-19? So you might be traveling, you might be required to come in, get a test to come into work or go to a something for an antigen test. So like those nasal swabs uh, or the nasal pharyngeal swabs, the vaccine will not impact your test results on there. And so when you get the vaccine, it's injected into the arm. The mRNA and those lipid nanoparticles will get into the muscle cells near the injection site. And there's no way for the mRNA to travel to the respiratory tract. The MR mRNA is very fragile. It has a very short half-life. It's designed to break down quickly. So the mRNA will get into the cells. It will make the protein that it will break down and you're going to stop producing the protein. Uh, mRNA does not live outside the cell. We have all sorts of molecules that break down RNA in between our cells and on our surfaces. Some of this is to break down, you know, dead or damaged cells, but it's also an important antiviral response. A lot of viruses are RNA. We've been trained to see our, if RNA outside the cell is bad and to break it down. So there's no way that the RNA could travel from the shoulder to the uh, respiratory tract, and then it wouldn't be in high enough concentrations to detect, even if it could. So it will not impact your antigen tests. Now on the antibody test side, if you're getting um, an antibody test for the spike protein, you certainly would hope that you would show up as uh, having antibodies. So about seven to 14 days after the first dose, in certain antibody tests, you should start showing uh, detectable antibody levels. <clears throat> Next question, can mRNA from the vaccine get in, uh, into your DNA and alter it? The answer is absolutely not. So if you remember back to biology courses, there's the central dogma. You make, you know, you can make DNA, new DNA from DNA. Um, you know, you transcribe DNA into RNA using a DNA dependent RNA polymerase. You know, that RNA goes from the nucleus out into the cytoplasm where it finds the ribosomes and then it makes protein. So this is a one-way one -way path. And so there is no reasonable possibility based on the totality of our knowledge of cell biology, reverse transcriptase, human genetics, and the immune system that mRNA vaccines can impact your DNA. The mRNA is going to stay outside the nucleus, it's going to make protein, and then it's going to break down. There are no natural mechanisms that would take the RNA from the cytoplasm and get it into the nucleus. Even if it got into the nucleus, there's no way to make DNA from that RNA, and then there's no way to integrate it into the DNA. Now, you might ask about HIV and other viruses that can go against this process that make reverse transcriptase. So HIV and hepatitis B do have the ability to make RNA into DNA in the cytoplasm, but it's only that viral RNA. That viral RNA has special sequences that are recognized by that. You know, that reverse transcriptase is not going to pick up any random RNA and make DNA from it. It has to be specially targeted. And the mRNA in this vaccine, in these vaccines are not specially targeted. Now, HIV also has special enzymes that carry that RNA into the nucleus and then insert it into the genome. Well, again, it's only specific. It's only primed for HIV RNA. So it couldn't pick up um, this mRNA or any other mRNA in your cell and do that. So a person who, does, who has HIV is still perfectly fine to get the vaccine because the HIV reverse transcriptase couldn't do anything with this RNA. So there's no way that you could make DNA from this RNA and have it impact the genetics of your cells. And also it's nowhere near sperm or egg cells either. There's no way it could do anything to those cells. Uh, there's questions, uh, how long will the vaccine protect me and will one course be enough? By one course, I mean the two dose course. So both shots in the series. You know, it's too soon to tell how long this protection will last. Again, we only have a few months of vaccine data here and only about 14 months from natural infection and we haven't had enough re-exposures yet. But the data for the six and eight month time points looks really promising. It looks like immunity does last and provides protection over a period of time. Um, immunity from natural infection seems to last. Again, um, T and B cells may decline over a period of time, but it does seem like there's protection there that will at least get people through a year. 
Uh, the bad news side of things, the four coronaviruses that cause a common cold, they tend to, you know, people can be reinfected with those within a year. We'll see if this coronavirus acts similarly. Uh, but back on the good news side, there are memory cells specific for the original SARS 17 years after that initial 2003 outbreak. Um, and I should note that the state health department is developing plans for one, two, and five year cycles of vaccination. Now you may hear that antibody titers are declining in people who have been naturally infected, uh, you know, over like the six months after an infection. Yeah, that's true for any infection. You know, you get a peak of antibodies and they wane. Now the question is, what's the threshold of protection? Is it down here? Is it up there? You know, for things like smallpox, 1% of the initial immune response is enough to protect against reinfection. We'll have to find out um, here. Now, we're still looking at T cells, we're looking at antibody duration, but also note if immunity wanes, while you might not be completely protected from reinfection, reinfection might be less serious, like a seasonal cold, which I think most people would be okay with. There is some talk in the UK, and it was proposed in the US to maybe drop down to one dose to uh, expand the number of people to be covered. I do not recommend that, and neither does the FDA or CDC at this point. So follow the two dose guideline. Um, yeah, because we don't know when efficacy from the first shot wanes. You want to be able to stimulate that immune response, that memory response. We know we can do that at 21 and 28 days. We don't know about longer periods of time. There can be multiplicative effects. Um, you know, it may result in a lower peak antibody titer spacing these out might result in shorter length of immunity and you may not have as strong of a memory response if you don't get that second dose in a reasonable amount of time here. Question, I've had SARS-CoV-19, should I still get vaccinated? The answer is yes. Again, because we don't know how long immunity lasts and this should be like getting a booster shot. It would boost the strength and duration of the existing protection. So the CDC says you should get vaccinated regardless of if you've been infected previously. They should not make you take an antibody test to see if you have antibodies before offering vaccination. Um, but if you're currently ill, you should wait until your isolation period ends before you go because you don't want to expose anyone. Now, immunity from natural infection has been shown to be pretty powerful for three months. So you might, you could consider putting it off to the end of the 90 day period if you've been infected. But, you know, much longer than that, I wouldn't recommend waiting. Now, this has been a biggie. I'm pregnant or breastfeeding. Should I still get vaccinated? Again, I'm not a medical doctor. You know, this, I can't necessarily give medical advice. I can give the best information on the data out there. So consult your physician and pediatrician. But it should be said that, you know, anything in like that spike protein, if there were issues with the spike protein causing issues with pregnancy outcomes, you should be seeing that in natural infection as well. And there are no indications of adverse pregnancy outcomes during natural COVID-19. Um, vaccination could provide some benefits to the developing fetus or the young child. Um, vaccination could allow transfer of antibodies through the placenta or via the breast milk. Now it should be noted that while there are no clinical trials, no clinical trials have been done in pregnant or lactating women, you know, this is always the last group to get tested um, in a clinical trial. Uh, there is no reason to expect vaccination with one of these vaccines to help to harm a developing fetus or nursing infant. You know, just the science says there's really nothing there that should trigger any issues. Now, there are some viral vector vaccines in the pipeline. These may not be recommended for pregnant women, um, but the RNA vaccines and the protein-based vaccines will probably be fine. Uh, there's some interim animal studies from Moderna and Pfizer that show no concerning signs. Some people did get pregnant during the clinical trials. Doesn't seem to have had adverse effects on them. Uh, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists does support the vaccination of pregnant and lactating women with either of the vaccines. And uh, there's a great video from one of my colleagues who I did a postdoc with, a Dr. Stephanie Langle. She works at the Duke Human Vaccine Institute. Uh, she works on maternal, fetal, infant, and breast milk community. She works with SARS-CoV-2. So she studies this. This is what she does. She's also a new mother. She has a six month old and she got the vaccine, you know, like two days after it came out. And she put together a great video um, that you, you can click through if you want more information about this from someone who's a real expert in the field. 
Now, are there any issues with vaccines and fertility? This has spread on the internet. Um, a Pfizer scientist who left nine years ago uh, argues that he, in, in general, he argues against vaccines. And also, you know, I'd be skeptical of anything this guy says because he said the pandemic was over in the UK back in November. Uh, this guy claims the spike protein resembles a protein involved in placental development that could lead to infertility. If that was true, any person who's been naturally infected would have issues with fertility as well. You know, that spike protein is in the virus, it's in the vaccine. So if, you know, anyone who had been naturally infected, they'd be having problems with fertility. There is absolutely no data to support that anyone who's been vaccinated or naturally infected has issues with fertility. Now, also, there are only four amino acids out of 1,273 amino acids that are similar in these two proteins. An antibody has to recognize a region larger than that. So there's no reason to expect that there would be antibodies that would cross-react between the two proteins. I'll refer back to Dr. Langle. She had a quote in the New York Times the other week. Um, Coronavirus spike protein and the placental protein in question have almost nothing in common, making the vaccine highly unlikely to trigger a reaction to these delicate tissues. The two proteins share only a minuscule stretch of material. Mixing them up would be akin to mistaking a rhinoceros for a jaguar because they are wearing the same collar. Uh, one thing to note is that SARS-CoV-2 can cause systemic inflammation and vascular issues. So there are some case studies that indicate that COVID-19 infection and the inflammation that was, um, occurs as a response could lead to sexual dysfunction in men, including erectile dysfunction and anorgasmia. So, you know, maybe if you're on the fence about getting the vaccination, um, consider that, you know, because nat the vaccine's not going to trigger this inflammation like, you know, natural infection would. So you could be protecting a lot of things there. Um, the Moderna FDA briefing document on this topic, you know, studies, uh, study participants of childbearing potential were screened for pregnancy prior to each vaccination. Um, then the person could be excluded or discontinued from the study if they so chose. Uh, the study is collecting all outcomes for all reported pregnancy that occurred after vaccination or um, that was not detected pre-screening. And so far, there's been 13 pregnancies reported from people involved in the clinical trial, six vaccines, seven placebo. They're following up on the outcomes there. There's been some animal studies in rats that show no adverse effects. Um, the Pfizer briefing document, uh, 23 participants became pregnant during the study, nine withdrew, uh, the rest are following through. So we'll see how this turns out. But again, I don't see any reason to expect any impact on uh, fertility. Uh, there. Another question, uh, do either of the vaccine formulations contain aborted fetal tissues or cells? The answer is no. These vaccines are both produced in cell-free systems, so it's a chemical reaction that makes the RNA. So there are no human DNA, RNA cells, or tissues. The only RNA in there is for the spike protein. Uh, it should be noted that some of the testing for safety and efficacy was done in the HEC-293 cells. Uh, these cells are in just about every research institution throughout the country. They're very widely used, one of the most commonly used cell lines in labs. Um, but they were taken, they were initially isolated from tissues taken from a, a 1973 elective abortion that took place in the Netherlands. So again, there's none of this material in the vaccine. Some testing was done in these, uh, in these cells. Uh, the Vatican's Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith has weighed in and said that when alternative vaccines are not available, it is morally acceptable to receive these COVID-19 vaccines that were developed or tested using the cell lines originating from aborted fetuses. So the Vatican says it's okay. That's all right with me, but of course, everyone has to make their own decisions. But to reiterate, no human tissue in any form is in these vaccines. Uh, the next question, how long till we achieve herd immunity? When will things go back to normal? That depends on a lot of factors. You know, how long will the immunity from the vaccination last? Will the vaccine completely prevent a person from transmitting the viruses? You know, some vaccines will protect the person from getting sick showing disease, but they could still spread it to another person. There's some promising data from Moderna showing that, you know, that the immunity is completely neutralizing and prevents transmission, which is outstanding news. Some of this is going to depend on the efficacy of the vaccine distribution. Hopefully we can get it sped up here. Also it depends on the number of people who get vaccinated. You know, some 
I see a number of polls out there. The data varies wildly, but somewhere between 40 and 54 percent of adult Americans say they're not willing to get vaccinated. And that's going to seriously hamper efforts and will drag the pandemic out longer or at least, you know, and cause the mitigation effects, you know, like the distancing and masking to last for a longer period of time. To achieve herd immunity, either through natural infection or vaccination, we'll need somewhere between 55 and 82 percent of the population to be covered. Stats show that about one to two percent have been vaccinated and about six percent have had confirmed infections. And with asymptomatic cases and cases that weren't confirmed positive, the number is probably higher. But even then, we're probably only about, you know, at best a quarter of the way there. But hopefully as vaccination ramps up, we'll get closer. And Health and Human Services expects wide distribution by late spring. You know, I've had a very pessimistic outlook on this whole pandemic. I've, you know, expected it to last a long time. You know, people were shocked initially when I said, you know, be prepared for distancing and masks in the 2022. Well, I am incredibly optimistic right now. You know, as the vaccine rollout gets better, um, you know, that 95% eff efficacy is just outstanding. That's some of the best news we could have hoped for. So I, I'm really hopeful that late summer and this fall are going to look a lot better. You know, some we'll see how, you know, immunity lasts in the next year and the next winter, but I think things are really looking up based on this information. I'm sorry, I'm running long, but here's the last slide. You may have heard in the news that there are a couple of variants of the virus that are circulating. Um, you know, there's the UK variant, there's the South African variant. Uh, the UK variant has shown up in the US. I expect it's probably actually all over the place now. Um, so I don't think, you know, the cat's out of the bag. I don't think any additional travel bans will work to contain it. Uh, but it is expected that viruses will mutate. Um, the SARS, especially RNA viruses, should be said that this virus in particular mutates slower than a lot of the other RNA viruses because there is some proofreading activity. Now, mutations happen all the time. The question is, are they biologically meaningful? Most of the time, they are not. Now, it's noted that some of these variant viruses may be more transmissible because they bind ACE2 more efficiently. Um, that could mean they're more contagious. We still have to see. Um, there's also concerns that variants will escape neutralizing antibodies. Now, that would be the biggest thing because if they did that, the vaccine would be less effective. But keep in mind, we make antibodies to all sorts of areas on the spike protein. It's not just one type of antibody that binds the spike protein. It could be dozens of different types that neutralize it. So mutations in one area will not prevent the antibodies from binding to the other areas. Uh, some preliminary data from Pfizer shows that it still neutralizes the UK variants. Uh, we're waiting on data on the South African variants, but I would expect that we should still get pretty good protection um, for now. But the good thing, we have this mRNA platform, and if major mutations happen, we could have new vaccines adapted to the variants in a matter of four weeks. All right, that is all my slides. I thank everyone for their attention. I'm happy to take any questions either via, you know, you can turn on your microphone, you can enter them in the chat, or uh, you can email me. I'll go back to the first slide at any time. Uh, I know the slides will be distri distributed, so my contact information will be on there as well. So thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your attention. Dr. Fisher, um, again, as we're waiting, if there are any questions, uh, the audience can unmute themselves or put the question in the chat. We will be sending out these uh, handouts today. Um, there also will be a survey form for those who wish CE um, to complete, and that's how you'll obtain your CE. Um, this session will be recorded. We will be sharing this recording with all participants but it may not be available till Friday as we have to uh, edit the recording and upload it to make it accessible to everyone. For those in the audience who have not yet received the vaccine, the vaccine in Michigan is available now to dental professionals. It is a county by county in the city of Detroit rollout through the health department. If you need any assistance in finding out how to sign up to receive the vaccine,
I see a see a question from uh, Dr. Jones. A uh, question about if a person's taking ACE inhibitors, is the virus more or less likely to attach or cause illness? Uh, yeah, that was a concern early on. It doesn't seem that ACE inhibitors or anything else in that uh, pathway, it doesn't seem like they have any impact on susceptibility or progression of the disease. Uh, once you get the vaccine, if you were to sneeze that someone could get the virus, um, no, uh, if you're, there's nothing in the vaccine that could cause a person to become infectious, but say there's, they're still working to try to figure out if a person is vaccinated and then they are exposed to someone with, you know, COVID-19, could they, could that vaccinated person still get some virus in their system and spread it to others? So we don't know yet, but probably not. You know, that, that would be like the ultimate goal would be to be sure that doesn't happen. Um, but that is not necessarily 100% in every vaccine. We'll have to, we're still waiting on the data on that. Um, so it is possible that you could unknowingly have COVID and get vaccinated. Um, you know, you could be exposed a few days in advance. Uh, you could be in the incubation process, feel fine and get the vaccine. Uh, that shouldn't have any impact. Um, it's probably not going to stop disease, but it's not going to have any uh, adverse effects there. You know, and if you do develop COVID between the first and second dose or like immediately after the first dose, uh, definitely check with your, with your doctor to see if it would be wise to go ahead with the second dose or not. It, it should be fine, but... Um, Uh, I don't think uh, 18 days rather than 21 days would be an issue on the Pfizer vaccine. I mean, if they scheduled you for that, that should be okay. And again, it you know doesn't have to be pre precisely on the nose 21 and 28 days, but as close to that as possible. Um, any interactions with any main medications? I haven't seen any data that indicates there'd be any interactions with any medications. Um, I don't see why there would be. So I, I, but you know, they'll, yeah. And they didn't even ask me about other medications when I went in to fill out the form. Uh, main questions were, you have a history of allergies, uh, anaphylaxis, um, immune suppressing conditions. Dr. Fisher, this is Marcy. There was a question sent to my cell phone. Um, people ask if their staff um, receiving the first dose of the vaccine, should they continue to follow recommended safety protocols for 10 days after receiving the first dose? Absolutely. You know, you should continue following them. You know, the vaccine's not a get out of jail free card. Also remember that full immunity is probably not going to kick in until about two weeks after the uh, second dose. And also, you know, the data isn't out there yet on if a person could still potentially spread the virus after being vaccinated. So, I mean, I, I expect data on that to come out pretty soon. So, you know, definitely continue following safety protocols and also, especially in the office, set a good example for the patients coming in as well and for those who have not been vaccinated. Um, Long-term side effects. You know, it's obviously we've only been studying this for a few months, but I don't see any reason to expect there to be long-term side effects, you know, and if there were long-term effects, it would probably be the same as, you know, it would probably be less than any long-term effects would be caused by the actual viral infection itself. I mean, you know, it's an unknown. We never know with a new drug, a new treatment, what the long-term impacts are going to be. I don't expect there to be any, but, you know, that's not a guarantee. I think the odds are very, very, very low. And again, remember that actual infection with, with the virus does have potential for a lot of severe long-term consequences. And, you know, the vaccine could help you avoid damage um, that an actual infection would cause. Uh, to our audience, we thank you for uh, staying with us as we went a little bit over. If you have any continued questions, please feel free to email the Detroit Dental Society or Dr. Fisher. We will work very hard to get you an answer. Um, also, if your staff in watching this presentation have any questions, we are happy to follow up. 
we, we thank Dr. Fisher for his time, this excellent presentation, and we will continue to send out updates to our dental community. Um, we